Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST app, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 39 in our series for 2021. And today's date is Friday, October the 29th. First, I'll be talking to Bob Sharpless, the Deputy Chairman of the Springfield City Group, which is Australia's first private company to create a smart city. And I'll be talking to Indeed economist Callum Pickering about the latest jobs figures. But, but now, let's talk to Bob Sharpless. Bob, uh, you're Managing Director of the MUR Group and you guys are building a city, Springfield. Tell us about it. Uh, yeah, well, we've, we've actually been on this journey now for about 30 years. 30 years. So we, yeah, we've been now classified as a city. Uh, we started off as a very large master plan community, but you know, back in 1991, uh, my business partner, Maha Sinafambi came across a parcel of land, nearly 3000 hectares. And for literally the last 30 years, we've been converting the property from what was once a, a, t- a timber and forestry operation with a population of one who was a caretaker to, to now a an emerging uh, city on the edge of Brisbane uh, with a population of almost 50,000 people. That's extraordinary. And, and, uh, but but it's, quite, it's quite a unique city, isn't it? Uh, well, we'd like to think so. I mean, uh, traditionally, uh, governments tend to, you know, to undertake these sorts of projects, whereas uh, you know, we're, a, if you like, a private developer of modest size that you know, set out to do something that's clearly very, very large and significant. So the start of this project, like a lot of these undertakings is about residential development and creating you know that base level of infrastructure but but increasingly we found ourselves wanting to you know do things differently than had been done elsewhere and in particular we wanted to in, to create employment for for the people that were here or were going to come and live here and we adopted a, a goal of having one job for every three people uh, that would live here and so one of our you know, big challenges has been to identify you know, those uh, business themes that would create the future employment for the people that we would be attracting to live here. And what themes would they be? Well, again, to start off with, it was some of the more traditional themes. I mean, um, education has certainly been something that we've been very strong on. We've got 11 schools here, a university, a TAFE, uh, you know, lots of ch- childcare centres. So we've we've attracted a pretty young population. The average age is 29. So, and they're quite fertile. There's over three three children per household. So, you know, to me that's a fairly obvious theme in the way that you would then look to, you know, build facilities that would cater for the evolution of of children and as they progress through education. But we've been supporting that uh, with health. So we have. A component of the project called Health City, which involves both you know public and private health provision. Uh, we've also got you know the traditional retail shopping centre called Orion Town Centre, which is a sort of a you know regional shopping centre with the Coles and the Woolworths and the Kmart's and those sorts of opportunities. We've certainly played very strongly in the IT space. Uh, so we've got the Polaris Data Centre. We have dark fibre uh, that connects us. Uh, back into Brisbane, and we've reticulated fibre through through the community. You know, a long time before uh, MBN was a requirement, and increasingly we've started to play in the energy space, where we're working with a uh, French company called Engie to to achieve a zero net energy position by 2038. So they're just they're just a few of the themes that we've identified. As I said, what we're trying to do ultimately is attract you know businesses that can be located in Springfield that will create the future jobs for the people that either live here or can commute here you know in a pretty uh, pretty efficient way and of course you you're also working with other partnerships so you're also working with other corporations like Mervac and Lindley's and, you, and major in that AVO aren't you uh, that's correct yeah so we knew very early on Leon that we we couldn't do everything and we didn't have the expertise to to do everything so uh, we've we've tended to adopt a model where we play the role of master developer uh, and then we have a number of long-term partnerships with the organizations that you've just mentioned and a few others as well 
you know, where we work collaboratively with them for them to develop in accordance with our master plan. And in the case of uh, Land Lease, yes, that relationship started back in 1999. So uh, we've been going with them now for well over 20 years. And uh, so tell us about those partnerships. I mean, how do you manage those? I mean, uh, there would be a fair, fair, fair bit of documentation and governance work in that, wouldn't there? But there is, and, 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 and the commercial arrangements are different for the different types of arrangements. But, but primarily, you know, we, we, we give people the opportunity to develop our land under a sort of a sub-development arrangement. And then we sort of share sometimes the provision of infrastructure, which is required for, for, the, for the land that they're developing, together with some of the other parts of the project that we're developing. And then often we work on a sort of a, almost a royalty type arrangement where we take uh, a percentage of the of the selling price of the development that is sold. So that works particularly well for residential because what we found is that as the residential values have grown and grown and grown, obviously our ability to continue to tap into that has been a far better return for us than if we had have sold the land you know, many, many years ago. You can only ever sell the land once. So in our experience, we're better to sort of retain the land and develop and continue to add infrastructure to the land to grow the value and then commercialise that value with the agreements that we have with our different, uh, with our different partners. But some, some are different. So there are some models where you know, we have done joint ventures where we've contributed land, they've contributed matching amounts of, of capital and we've jointly gone and borrowed the rest. So it just depends on what the most efficient structure needs to be. Now, as part of that innovation, you're also looking at uh, promoting social and environmental sustainability. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, again, you know, we, we, we have a, a bit of a blank canvas here. So we have the opportunity to, you know, do things in ways that perhaps haven't been done before. We don't have the legacy issues that often happen when you're doing development on land, which is either constrained or it's got some other predominant use. So, uh, you know, a third, a third of the land has been retained for open space and conservation, which is much higher than you would traditionally see in projects of this nature. Normally, there's a requirement of uh, about 10%. You know, increasingly, as I said, we've, we've wanted to be a lot more efficient in terms of energy. So we've, we've always encouraged that through some of the uh, initiatives that we've undertaken. And, and a good example of that is the amount of solar penetration that we have within the project. Uh, we're the highest, basically, suburb in Queensland uh, in terms of penetration of solar. And then, as I said, we you know, entered into an agreement with a French company uh, called Engie, which is designed to last for 50 years with one of the early goals to get to zero net energy within a 20-year period. So we, we started that arrangement in 2018 um, and we want to complete that achievement by, uh, by 2038. So... You know, we, we tend to be a bit ahead of the curve. You know, we look at ways of creating a bit more uniqueness within our project. And yeah, our, our green credentials, our ability to put in, you know, high quality energy and telecommunication infrastructure has certainly been something that has set us apart from other large residential projects, that's for sure. And we've been doing it for a long time. We might only be getting the recognition now, but, you know, we, we, we were doing what they called Apple Classrooms of Tomorrow uh, you know, over 20 years ago, where we were working with Apple to put computers into schools, a school here, and then testing the levels of numeracy and literacy that the students were achieving as a result of having that type of technology in the school. I mean, these days you'd laugh at it and think that that was so, so rudimentary, but back then it was seen as quite a novel thing to do. Uh, we also had Optus in there with an intranet and we were giving free computers to everyone who bought a block of land here and built a house. Again, with the concept of creating this sort of connectivity. So, so we've been quite early adopters of this sort of technology and not, not every technology prevails. Even the intranet stuff we did, that became redundant with the internet. But yeah, you know, we've always wanted to enable this community in a in a in a technologically efficient way, because we knew that that was what the future was going to be. And uh, because it was well, the demographic of your community is much younger than other community. It would be much easier to do that, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's correct. So they're very they're early, very early adopters of the technology. Uh, they embrace it 
you know, very, very easily. And it, it is really interesting because, because, you know, we have a young community and they're not about legacy and heritage. They're all about the future and they want it quickly. And that's a, that's a very significant difference to a lot of locations where, you know, when, when things are wanting to be upgraded or developed, there's often a lot of resistance to that because there's a lot of legacy issues which have to be dealt with. Uh, the community might be a lot older and they actually don't want, they actually don't want the development. They don't actually want the progress because that might mean, you know, a change to their well-established lifestyle. We, we have the reverse of that. We have young people who actually want the future and they want it quickly. And, and the digital technology that we evolved in, I think gives them a, a great window into, you know, what the future looks like. Well, conversely, it would also keep you, you, you as, a, as a company on your toes, wouldn't it? Because they would always be demanding the latest, wouldn't they? And that's, that's exactly right. The technology continues to evolve. You know, it's, it's interesting. We, you know, we built dark fibre to Springfield because when we were trying to locate businesses here, uh, we were being heavily constrained by the lack of connectivity. And at that stage, you know, we were captive to the large providers of that uh, infrastructure. And so we decided to build it ourselves so that we could enable this project. And, you know, the process of doing that actually was a pretty steep learning curve. But, you know, along the way, we learned that the, um, you know, the provision of these types of infrastructures is actually commercially very profitable if you, if you, do, it, if you do it efficiently. You know, these days, again, there's lots of different providers who play in that space. But, you know, when we started doing it, when we were first putting fibre optic capability into a project that we own called Brookwater, you know, it was very novel and, and we, were, we were working with Telstra to do that as a trial. You know, these days, it's, as I said, it's commonplace. Well, at that time, it was very blue sky. Well, that's probably right. <laughs> well, Bob, thank you very much for your time and uh, really appreciate it and good on you. Well, thank you very much. And now let's talk to Indeed economist Callum Pickering. Well, Callum, the payroll data showed jobs edged up 0.2% ahead of a lockdown's ending. And that's a sign that the job losses might have come to an end. What's your view about that? Yeah, possibly. Um, so New South Wales has now been reopened for a couple of weeks. Obviously, uh, Melbourne's heading in, in the same direction. And that does suggest that employment is going to begin to, to pick up pretty steadily um, over the, the remainder of this year. The, the payrolls data is obviously a a sign that that's, that process is beginning. And, and traditionally, these payroll data has actually, actually been revised upwards over time. So if it's already ticking up now, there's a, there's a good chance that in a couple of weeks when those revisions come through, that the result will be stronger again. Most of the, the forward-looking indicators we have for employment are, are pretty positive right now. And I'm talking about things such as job vacancies and, and job advertisements. And that suggests that the, the lab market is likely to recover pretty quickly um, now that these states have, have reopened. So that's a, a good sign for the Australian lab market. Indeed. Uh, but the issue is uh, job uh, vacancies are high too, aren't they? And would there be problems of actually people coming back to work? I mean, people are, businesses are crying out for people at the moment. Yeah, there's a lot of jobs available at the moment, and at least for the last couple of months, there's been impediments to filling some of those roles, particularly across both Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, when I speak to, to businesses, and I've been doing a fair bit of that lately, they're all talking about skill shortages. They're all talking about difficulties sourcing talent for some roles. Um, so there is obviously some, some difficulty in that space. But traditionally, when vacancies are high, that does usually mean that employment in the future is going to increase quite strongly uh, as well because vacancies that we have today are, to some degree, future employment. So that the fact that there are so many jobs available right now that do need to be filled uh, does suggest to me that the labour market will tighten over the next few months. And uh, you're confident that uh, people who uh, might have left work because of the lockdowns will be coming back? Absolutely. I mean, that's what we saw last year when lockdowns were lifted. And I think the experience that we get this time will be similar to last year. So when lockdowns were lifted uh, across the country in, in June last year and, and in Victoria a little bit later, people who lost their jobs flooded back into the workforce. Some found jobs immediately. Others had to search for a, a few months. But what we did see was that participation in the workforce rose quite sharply and within a matter of months was actually uh, higher than it was before the pandemic 
began. So I do think that we will see a rerun of that to, to some degree over the next three or four months. Uh, but the ABS industry job show data shows the big losers over the three months to August were retail accommodation, food services, arts and recreation, which is no surprise given the lockdowns in South East Australia. But over the last year, the big losers in terms of jobs have been agriculture, wholesale trade and construction. Yeah, so there's a couple of interesting dynamics at, at play here. There are some industries that are very sensitive to lockdown, and that includes things such as retail, hospitality, um, arts and recreation. And the plight of those industries has been very visible um, since the, the pandemic began. These industries really struggle to operate at, at all when these lockdowns are in place. There are other industries, though, that have been sort of more heavily impacted over a, a more prolonged period of time. And we're seeing a little bit more of that through industries such as construction and wholesale trade. Some of them have at times been impacted by a, a lack of demand, although some of them have just been hampered recently by more widespread lockdowns in, in the case of construction. That sort of had an impact over the past few months. And for some other industries, they've been hampered a little bit by supply chain issues, which have um, been incredibly disruptive for some industries. And I think uh, wholesale trade would fit into that category. Right, OK. And do you expect these are going to pick up? Well, any industry that's sensitive to lockdown will begin to, to pick up now that uh, Sydney and, and Melbourne are, are reopening. So that's obviously good news for them. These supply chain issues that the country is dealing with at the, at the moment seems like it'll be something that will take longer to fix. And there hasn't really been much progress made in, in that space. They're not necessarily dependent on the lockdowns that we have domestically. Um, so there's sort of no reason to expect that, that bounce back and, until uh, these supply chain issues uh, overseas, you know, begin to diminish. The supply chain issues are fascinating because it's actually led to an increase in prices and uh, some markets are factoring that in as an increase in inflation. I'm not entirely convinced the supply chain issue does result in inflation, but, uh, you know, uh, it may. What's your view about that? Well, the perception right now is that a lot of businesses have been trying to absorb the increase in um, prices rather than pass them on to consumers. And the concern is the longer these supply chain issues persist, the less able these uh, businesses will be, be to continue to absorb those costs. Um, so the expectation is at some point, these higher producer costs are going to get passed on to consumers in the form of higher inflation. I think the key question, though, is whether these increases in prices are likely to be temporary or, or more persistent. And central banks are sort of dealing with that issue at the moment. We've seen inflation spikes overseas. We haven't seen that in Australia just yet. But, but central banks are sort of trying to disentangle what this all means for future inflation, whether this is something that will last for three months or six months, uh, or whether it's something that could persist for maybe a year or two. Um, and I think that will frame a, a lot of the, the conversation we have around monetary policy globally for the next 12 months. Well, that's interesting because, I mean, some of the bank flag raising interest rates, certainly in New Zealand they have... Uh, and uh, all of that uh, ties in with the RBA saying, no, we're not going to raise rates till 2024 at the earliest. Uh, but some forces in the markets are saying, no, we're actually going to see a rise in rates in 2023, uh, maybe the end of 2022. What's your view about that? Well, yeah, there's a lot of disagreement right now. We have the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, which have been uh, very proactive raising rates uh, already. Uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia is obviously played it more cautious, which is understandable given some of the things we've gone through over the past few months. There are arguments uh, pro and against raising, potentially raising rates next year. The argument for is that the, the labour market is likely to, to rebound quite strongly um, given the, the high level of um, job creation across the country right now. So it's quite plausible that the unemployment, unemployment rate is in the, the low 4% range by early next year. And if it gets down to that rate, you've got to start to think that wage growth is going to pick up. That could feed through to inflation, in addition to some of these supply chain issues that we're already dealing with. And so suddenly you're looking at a labour market that is incredibly tight. Borders still are, I mean, they're open, but they're not 
operating as, as normal and you've got wage growth higher, inflation picking up, which provides a pretty compelling argument for the Reserve Bank to, to hike rates. Now, the Reserve Bank is, is probably going to want to play pretty cautious if they can. If they think that inflation isn't going to go too high, and, and by too high, I mean sort of above the, the 3% level, they may be willing to, to hold off for now. I don't think they, they want to be uh, too aggressive with regards to their policy. All the communications indicate that they, they want to play it pretty safe. Uh, it's just a matter of whether the, the flow of data and the economy allows them to, to be that cautious. Because like I said, I do expect labour market to get much tighter over the next few months and, and into 2022. And, uh, but uh, the thing we have to be looking out for then is signs of wages growth. Well, that's right. And we haven't seen that at all yet. And I think the, the lockdowns we've had over the past three months have, have probably delayed any breakout in wages. Um, but, it, but it's clear that a lot of businesses are having a lot of trouble sourcing talent right now, particularly skilled talent. And if that continues and these skill shortages do become more widespread or exacerbated, then that is going to begin to trigger higher wage growth at, at some point. Now, that, that process is likely to be delayed somewhat by workplace agreements. Um, the minimum wage didn't increase by uh, that much over the past year. Other workplace agreements have as, as well have been relatively low in terms of the, the wage growth that they're, they're offering. But as those agreements expire and new agreements are made, they're going to reflect the, the labour market conditions um, that are present at the time. And that's going to be a much tighter labour market, which does suggest that any new agreements that are made are going to have higher wages baked into them. And, and so over the, the course of the next 12 months, maybe the next 18 months, I, I do think we are going to see that, that spike in, in wage growth that could trigger uh, higher inflation and may justify tighter monetary policy. Which would indicate that the RBA might raise interest rates before 2020. Yeah, that's right. I, I think most of the risks to, to policy at the moment, is that it happens sooner than the, the RBA is flagging right now. Um, now, th there's obviously a lot of uncertainty in the market. Pandemics prove that again and again, which is why a, a certain degree of cautiousness is uh, quite reasonable from the Reserve Bank. But if we do get on top of, of COVID um, and that the vaccine works and case numbers are low and there's not that, that risk, that, that health risk with, with going about your, your daily lives, then a lot of the uncertainty associated with the pandemic sort of has to, to wash away. And then you're just looking at what does the economy look like? And the answer to that is likely that the labour market will be very tight and that wages and inflation are expected to, to increase quite a bit. And if you've got that, that situation without that uncertainty, then the Reserve Bank should feel more confident about raising rates. But again, like I said, that's all going to become a lot clearer over the next 6, 12, 18 months. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't be surprised if the Reserve Bank does have to upgrade their economic forecasts and bring forward those expectations of, of rate hikes. Well, Callum, that's all fascinating stuff, and thank you very much for your time. Always a pleasure. Thank you. So what's happening in the news? Well, the Morrison government has spent nearly $13 million promoting its climate credentials to voters while refusing to release modelling, underpinning its plan to cut emissions. It will spend $12.9 million of taxpayer funds on an advertising campaign that claims credit for Australia's increasing uptake of renewables and cuts in emissions. Details of the cost of the Making Positive Energy advertising campaign were disclosed by officials from the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources during a Senate estimates hearing on Monday. The eye-watering sum includes a $10.45 million spent on television, cinema and billboard advertising and $1.78 million spent on the development of a website for the campaign. The taxpayer-funded advertising campaign promotes Australia's progress towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the increase in renewable energy technologies and has primarily been run in the lead-up to the COP26 talks in Glasgow. The campaign's materials promote Australia as a leader in the uptake of solar energy and is supporting the increased use of renewables in industry and hydrogen production. The campaign does not mention the significant role played by state and territory governments, which have stepped in to fill a policy gap left by successive coalition governments, which tried to pull down most of the policies that are responsible for the boom in renewables. 
And Scott Morrison says Australia's commitment to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 will not be legislated, with five yearly reviews by the Productivity Commission to measure job creation in a pitch to regions that it won't devastate them. The Morrison government has outlined a technological roadmap towards net zero emissions by 2050 that will require a contribution by every sector of the economy, including agriculture, and which relies in part on technologies that are not yet developed. The government plans to spend more than $20 billion in low emissions technologies by 2030, claiming this will leverage $60 to $100 billion in private sector investment. The technologies include soil carbon sequestration, where carbon is removed from the atmosphere and stored in soil, carbon capture and storage, CCS, production of low emission steel, and other ways to reduce energy use. The 129 page document did not specify the cost of the sweeteners for the coalition partner, the National Party. The government said its economic modelling, which it has not yet released, will result in individuals being $22,000 better off, gross national income will be 1.6% higher, and there would be a net creation of 62,000 jobs in regional mining and heavy industry. As part of a deal to secure the national support, the Productivity Commission will review the new plan every five years to measure the impact reducing emissions has on regional communities. Australia has long dragged its heels on climate action, putting it increasingly at odds with strategic allies including the US and UK. It is one of the dirtiest countries per head of population and a leading global supplier of coal and gas. Controversially, Australia's 2050 pledge offers no concrete plans to limit mining for fossil fuels and new coal-fired power stations. We want our heavy industries like mining to stay open, remain competitive and adapt so they remain viable for as long as global demand allows, Mr Morrison wrote. And MBN Co and Australia Post have paid executives nearly $300 million in corporate bonuses during the COVID-19 pandemic, despite being put on notice by the Morrison government about lavish taxpayer-funded perks. Annual reports for the government-owned Postal Corporation and the company open operating the National Broadband Network revealed generous payments in the 2020 and 2021 financial year. And Melbourne's diners, drinkers, shoppers and motorists sent spending in the city soaring past $350 million in the first three days after the end of the sixth lockdown. Sales data compiled by NAB from its FPOS terminals around the city showed Melbourneians spent over 20% more on Friday, Saturday and Sunday than the previous weekend, including what one NAB executive called a mind-boggling 2,340% increase for beauty salons and barbers where haircuts were finally possible. Spending in the cafe, restaurant, bar and club sector almost doubled in the city's first three days of significantly eased restrictions. With the 15 kilometre limit scrapped, motorists lost no time getting back on the road. Spending at service stations was up 31% and on general automotive was up 8% on the previous weekend. NAB, which handles about 22% of electronic payments in Victoria, recorded $76 million in sales in Melbourne and $114 million for the whole state between Friday and Sunday, indicating that total transactions exceeded $350 million and $518 million, respectively. And Australians remain divided over the politics of the pandemic as the country reopens, research from Bastion Insights shows. The Morrison government is recording a rebound in perceptions this month, as the country hits vaccination targets, while in Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, residents remain strongly divided. The research shows the concern over exposure to COVID-19 differs across settings and states. Overall, Australians feel most exposed about larger events, 67%, and travelling on planes and at airports, 66%. Concern is also high about catching public transport, 60%, and visiting shopping centres, 56%, as well as restaurants, cafes and pubs, 51%. Workplaces, 33%, and personal gatherings with friends and families, 30%, are perceived as lower risks. Victorians have higher concerns than their interstate counterparts about being in the workplace, commuting to work, and attending gatherings of family and friends. A quarter of Victorians are also concerned about their financial situation. Two in five Australians are keen to embrace overseas travel, but there is hesitancy, with just one in five ready to jump on a plane to go overseas in the next three months. And Australia Post will spend $400 million to boost parcel operations around the country after a 32% surge in volume over the past two years and ahead of an expected record online Christmas shopping splurge. Consumers stuck in COVID-19 lockdowns pushed delivery systems to their limit during the pandemic, with Australia Post delivering more than 10 million parcels a week around the country. Newly named Chief Executive Paul Graham announced plans to boost spending on the government-owned company systems to more than $1 billion over three years. As part of the $1 billion program, 
$400 million will be spent by mid-2022 on new parcel facilities, fleet expansion and technology upgrades. Set to face Senate estimates for the first time this week, Mr Graham said recently opened parcel processing facilities in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide were helping to meet demand. Australia Post also has five new facilities being built in Perth, Melbourne's Bayswater and Tullamarine, Western Sydney and Botany. And Crown Resorts has escaped having the licence for its Melbourne casino cancelled, despite the Victorian Royal Commission finding the scandal-ridden casino is currently unfit to operate the business. Commissioner Ray Finkelstein found Crane's behaviour disgraceful and concluded that it must be found unsuitable to hold its licence. The James Packerback Company will be allowed to keep its licence for two more years under close scrutiny from an external monitor, according to the inquiry's 652-page report tabled to the Victorian Government on Tuesday morning. The state government appointed Stephen O'Brien QC as a monitor, giving him unprecedented powers, including the right to direct the Crown Board and veto any of its decisions. The report also recommended that Mr Packer slash his share in the company by 2024, saying the Casino Control Act should be amended to require his private investment vehicle, Consolidated Press Holdings, to reduce its 37% shareholding to less than 5%. The report said the casino giant's road forward will not be easy, and Crown will not be in control of its own destiny. Commissioner Ray Finkelstein said that the economic role played by Crown in Melbourne and the fact that it already started performing tipped the balance against completely cancelling the licence. Announcing the appointment of Mr O'Brien, who was a founding commissioner of the state's corruption watchdog, Gaming Minister Melissa Horn said he would have unprecedented powers as the Crown's so-called special manager. This includes the right to attend all Crown board meetings, direct the board and veto board decisions and inspect all records, books and documents. She added that the government accepted all the 33 recommendations from the report. It has introduced legislation into Parliament that deals with nine of the key recommendations, including introducing laws on Tuesday morning to increase the maximum penalty for breaches from $1 million to $100 million. The Royal Commission uncovered Crown had hidden and failed to pay a multi-million dollar state gambling tax bill, facilitated money laundering through its hotels and exploited problem gamblers. And Australia's biggest companies are abandoning plans to hold virtual meetings beyond the COVID-19 pandemic after facing a backlash from shareholders. Treasurer Josh Frydenberg granted companies relief from the Corporations Act, allowing them to hold virtual annual meetings until March next year, rather than in person, usually in hotel ballrooms or corporate offices. But investors have fiercely rejected attempts to make virtual AGMs a permanent fixture, fearing they will lose the right to eyeball and scrutinise company directors on their one day of the year. Following shareholder resistance, companies including Qantas, Brambles, Bendigo and Adelaide Bank have torn up proposed amendments to their constitutions to allow virtual AGMs. To strike a compromise and stamp out any creep towards digital-only AGMs, Federal Parliament introduced new laws this week, giving companies permission to hold hybrid, a blend of in-person and virtual meetings, on an ongoing basis. The legislation also makes it clear that shareholders should be given a reasonable opportunity to participate in AGM, even if they can't attend in person. It is a move the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors has welcomed. And Telstra has joined Team Australia on China. Telstra and the Australian Government have finalised a deal to buy and operate the largest telecommunications company in the Pacific, in a move largely seen as an effort to counter China's influence in the region. The deal comes after China's biggest telecoms operator had shown interest in buying Digicel Pacific. Digicel is the largest mobile phone carrier in the Pacific, with operations in Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Samoa, Vanuatu and Tahiti. The $2.1 billion deal to acquire and run Digicel is being funded largely by the government, which will provide $1.9 billion towards the acquisition. Telstra said it would contribute $360 million and own 100% of the company's ordinary equity. The deal, which is expected completed within the next six months, is consistent with Australia's long-standing commitment to growing quality investment in regional infrastructure, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade said in a statement. And Patrick Terminals is seeking to end decades of union conditions and controls over its workforce in the face of a two-year bargaining standoff, potentially forcing hundreds of wharfies onto the industry minimum. The Stevedore applied to the Fair Work Commission on Tuesday to terminate its agreement with the Maritime Union of Australia on the basis the deal was no longer fit for purpose and restricted its ability to meet customer needs at a time of huge strain on supply chains due to the pandemic. Patrick has proposed maintaining its 1,081 Wharfie salaries, leave and other pay rates for six months, but all other conditions, including controls over recruitment and manning, will be wiped out on termination and revert to the award. 
It comes as the MUA notified Patrick that its members would undertake 12-hour stoppages three days a week at Melbourne from next week and 24-hour strikes at Sydney and Brisbane, along with rolling one-hour stoppages and overtime bans. And housing affordability across Sydney has collapsed to its lowest level in at least a decade and is on track for the same point in Melbourne as the benefits of record low interest rates are overwhelmed by soaring property prices and stagnant wages growth. Analysis by Moody's Investor Services shows a jump in Sydney's median house price, now $1.3 million, means a household with an annual income of $135,000 will spend more than 45% of it servicing their new mortgage. In February, they needed 36% of their income. It's little better in Melbourne, where the median house price is now more than $960,000, with households spending an average 32.1% of their incomes on their mortgage. Melbourne households were paying 29.7% of their incomes towards their mortgages in February. And Australia's largest Bitcoin mine will come online in Byron Bay later this month, after local digital infrastructure company Mawson Infrastructure Group inked a deal with renewable energy powerhouse Gwynbrook Infrastructure Partners, setting the scene for a rollout of crypto mines across Australia. The mine is set to add around 0.4 exahash, a measure of computing horsepower, to global crypto mining operations and will be 100% powered by renewable energy generated at the Quinbrook site. Bitcoin mines, which are essentially large data centres with computing power dedicated to solving complex algorithms that secure and power the blockchain, can be turned on and off quickly. This gives power generators like Quinbrook an avenue to direct their energy should the broader Australian electricity grid require less supply, like during the middle of the night, or turn off if the electricity grid requires more. Quinbrook currently manages the Cape Byron Infrastructure Fund, which owns and operates a portfolio of biomass power stations near Byron Bay in New South Wales. And social media giants will face fines of up to $10 million for serious privacy breaches under reforms proposed by the Australian Government. The reforms would also require platforms to verify users' ages, get parental consent for children, and cease disclosing personal information if requested. That will include criminal penalties for repeated refusals to provide information requested by the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. On Monday, the Attorney-General, Michaela Cash, released draft legislation and a consultation paper arguing more needs to be done to protect children against harmful tracking, profiling or targeted marketing on online platforms. Separately, the Nationals MP, Anne Webster, has introduced a private members' bill to Parliament to make social media companies liable as publishers if they don't take down allegedly defamatory material within 48 hours of receiving a notice from the eSafety Commissioner. And that's it for this week. And next week, I'll be talking to Dom Holland, the Aussie entrepreneur and co-founder of American payments company Fast, which provides a single-click checkout button, freeing consumers of the need for passwords or the need to enter personal details. And I'll be talking to BIS Oxford Economics Chief Economist in Australia, Sarah Hunter. In the meantime, you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. And if you want, leave a comment. Wishing you all a safe and